it's like it, isn't it cool? It's like an alien. Just to practice? In college, I got paid to stay in a room for a month and not leave. Really? Yeah. Did you do that? Yeah, for a month. I didn't leave uh, one room. They bring you food. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I got really good at hacky sack. <laughs> yeah, five grand. Hmm? Like it's like being a lab rat for these like medical studies. Uh, they were studying your sleep pattern. Mm. <laughs> How many people in your class? Some people are skipping then. <laughs> I get really angry when that happens. The Berkeley time is your 10 minute buffer. <laughs> it's not when you're supposed to aim to be there on average 10 minutes after. <laughs> Berkeley time is like you're supposed to show up on the hour, but you have 10 minutes of re buffer, like relaxing. Not that you're supposed to show up 10 minutes after on average. <laughs> so half the time you're late. <laughs> That's right. I guess you're supposed to show up half, five minutes in. So if you can't, it should be 10 minutes across yeah, the all whole campus. Right? My undergrad, we finished 10 minutes early. Yeah, that just makes more sense. Like instead of teaching people to be late for everything. <laughs> Why? Oh, I did. I was. Do you mind do a whole sure. <laughs> panorama? Sure. So I get to start. This is weird. Hurry up, yeah. Welcome, EO 123, Lecture 33. Woo! Oh, so remnants is 61X. Right. This is from teaching 61C. 61C. <laughs> All right, so today we have a guest lecture going on there. I remember I told you to come on time, just so it look, appears that you've been coming on time all year. But now everybody knows. <laughs> right now, it's 10 after, so you're good. So today we have uh, Laura Waller. Um, she's going uh, to talk about optics. <laughs> um, so mostly about, so where I work is in computational optics, but sort of very much in the field of Fourier optics, which I'm going to give a crash course on. And it's the idea that optics is signals, light is a wave, and we can treat it like a complex signal as it passes through our imaging system, which is like a linear systems theory type thing. Um, so that's what Fourier optics is, is to treat your imaging system like uh, via systems theory and look at uh, spatial frequencies and stu stuff like that. So um, that's what I want to get into. If I'm using some optics jargon, because I had to like try to clean my slides and make them more signal processing-y, but if I, you see some optics jargon you don't know, just ask, because it's just my fault for not fixing it before I came here. OK, so what is computational imaging? Uh, Mickey does this too, so maybe you've already heard about this. We're doing it for optics, which is way better than MRI, because it has much better resolution, right? So optical wavelengths like one micron, you can really see small things. Yeah, well, that's 
Like we'll take questions <laughs> later. Um, okay. So uh, sort of the whole like motivation behind my field of research is this idea of trying to rethink how you design your camera systems. So uh, this is, I really like this stupid schematic of we keep trying to build cameras. We spend a lot of money on cameras, right? There's like, a huge market here. People spend huge money on really fancy cameras, and they're all after the same thing. A super fancy lens designed by like the best optics guy in the world who can uh, make this lens to take the perfect picture on your sensor. This is exactly what your eye does, right? Your eye tries to form an image at the back of the retina. Your, your brain actually does a bunch of computation on it. Um, but the idea is that we don't necessarily need to take that perfect picture. We can take some intermediate picture and then figure out the perfect picture later. And we might actually be able to figure out more uh, if we take the picture in this sort of like distributed way that we're going to talk about. So uh, you can think of your optical system as some hybrid analog di digital system. So you have like your optics, the lenses part is the analog piece. There's basically, um, there's no sampling until you hit the sensor. We always use digital sensors now. And so uh, once you've sampled it at your sensor, now you've got a digital system and you have to do digital operations on it. So uh, in my lab, we do both. So we know optics and we know the signal processing side. And so you have to think about this. When should I do the sampling piece uh, in order to get the most information through? OK, so going back 700 years of optics, uh, this is the, the first microscope, 1600s. You're going to get some optics knowledge here if you want it or not. Uh, and this was hundreds of years ago. This is one of the oldest fields of science in the world, mostly because we've been seeing things for a long time. But really, 700 years ago is when people started making optics, started designing optics. Uh, recording images, that, this is all photochemical. You might have seen a film camera once in your life when you were a kid. Uh, I used to use them. Um, but this was a couple hundred years ago. And really, only recently, we got these digital cameras, right? And digital cameras are actually fundamentally worse than, uh, than film recordings because they have much poorer resolution. So a film camera can record a gigapixel image, no problem. It's just that you can't digitally store it and replicate it and manipulate it afterwards. And that's worth a lot to us. So uh, almost everyone uses purely digital now. Still some forensics uh, cameras are in uh, film, and some hipsters like to use it for, to be cool. Um, so computational imaging is one step beyond this digital capture and storage and manipulation. It's that we can start to think about all of the post-processing and digital processing in the computer as one of the toolboxes of our imaging system design. So rather than try to capture the perfect image and then maybe do some post-processing to try to make it better or extract information out of it, let's start to think about uh, how can we redesign the optics such that the post-processing becomes um, tractable or better in some way. So here's a canonical example. And I'm talking about your computer is becoming a part of your imaging system. So maybe it's replacing optics, or maybe it's just doing, uh, maybe it's doing something uh, complementary to the optics. But you have to modify the optical design. So you can't call it computational imaging unless you're changing the optics. Here's a, this is like a really typical example for computational imaging. I take an, uh, this is like a piece of glass with a bunch of bumps on it and shove it into my camera. So uh, of course, when I take a picture, it doesn't look like much because it's, the light's now going through this like, grid of bumps, which is going to destroy the image. right? So now I take a picture. It doesn't look like a regular image at all. But I send it to a bunch of nerds to crunch the data. They solve an inverse problem, and you can get back a nice, pretty image. OK, who cares? My regular camera could have done this, right? Um, but this image is special because this is actually a, a life field image result, and it actually can be digitally refocused after the fact. So with some rather relatively simple computations, it's just a couple Fourier transforms and a projection slice theorem, then we can get images that can be post-processed to refocus them. You can't do this with a normal camera, right? Um, you have to take the data in a different way to be able to do this. Um, so then we're in near Silicon Valley, so the next step is start a company. This Lytro is the company of Ren Eng, who's a new faculty member here. And it, this is going to be on your cell phones soon, in the next five years. There's uh, tens of millions of dollars saying that it will be. Uh, this, this is a camera ray, essentially. And these are coming. In fact, they're already commercially available now. OK, so I want to talk a little bit about the kind of optics I do, which is uh, this stuff. So light is a wave. It's also a particle. 
So ray optics is to treat like, like it's going along a straight path. So I have some laser, and it's just a, a beam of light going in this straight path. I only keep track of the intensity as it goes along there. In my lab, we're working in this uh, area of wave optics, where basically we do microscopy where everything is small. And once you get small towards the size of the wavelength, then all these wave optics things matter. So what's a wavelength of light? Half a micron or so. So once you get down to those sort of size scales, you have to think about um, diffraction, interference, and all, all possible wave optics effects. Uh, Einstein proved that it's actually both, but we still like to generalize it to be one or the other whenever we can for simplification. So everybody knows about the wave nature of light. You know that different colors are different wavelengths, right? That's why you see color. But that's not what I want to talk about today. So for today, assume everything I'm talking about is one color. So this is laser beam. Say it's all green. This is a special property of the laser is that it's all one color, right? Um, so forget about, when I say frequency, it's not color. I'm not talking about color. I'm copying, talking about spatial frequency. OK, so that I need to explain a little bit more. And uh, here's some general, this is like your crash course in optics. Um, I have a ray of light. So the ray describes the direction in which the energy of the light is propagating, right? So I have this laser. It's going in that direction. This ray is propagating in that direction. But if I want to think of this as a wave, then I could draw these wave fronts. And they're always going to be perpendicular to the direction of propagation. So these wave fronts represent, this is a wave going like this. And these wave fronts basically are just like the peaks of, of these waves. So they're separated by 2 pi, the wavelength of light which is obviously going to be really small. So this is totally just a schematic. And it's traveling along the direction of the ray, which is always perpendicular to the wave front, right? Because you've got these wave fronts. If they're going like this, they're propagating in this direction perpendicular. If it's curved, they're going out like this. And it's actually propagating energy to lots of directions. OK? Um, so these are the wave fronts. Uh, so What's this, what's, what am I talking about spatial frequency? Well, the frequency here is set by the wavelength, right? So if this is space by 2 pi, this is, the free, this is your period, right? It's, it's, two, it's the wavelength. That's your period. Forget about the fact that this thing is actually traveling at the speed of light in this direction. Let's just ignore that for now. Um, but what I want to talk about is things that happen on a 2D plane. So this wavefront is traveling at some high angle relative to, say, this was my camera plane that I care about. It's, so x is describing this plane that I care about. Things are always traveling from left to right, but they can be at different angles, right? So what spatial frequency uh, is the wave along this direction, along this uh, plane of x? It's not spaced, it's not spaced now by the, by the uh, wavelength here. It's longer than the wavelength, right, because it's at this angle. So this is the spatial frequency that I talk about. And you can tell right now it's already going to be very proportional. To, it's going to be proportional to wavelength, right? And it's going to be proportional to the angle. Um, so if you think about it, so I'm just plotting. Basically, these are the peaks of the wave. So the, that'll be, say, here. And, and I can write this as a sine wave. Uh, light always is, is in sine waves. This is why Fourier is a great uh, decomposition basis for physics is because the real world operates in sine waves. Um, and so this is now a spatial frequency, a sign having some pitch, uh, big lambda, along the x direction, right? OK, so what is this uh, period, 1 over the spatial frequency? So this is my spatial frequency fx now. And this is the, uh, the period that it causes. I'm just going through all this so that it's clear for later. Um, so we can look at it very simply here. So the, this pitch is 1 over the spatial frequency. It's directly related to this angle of propagation. And so I get this simple triangle equation that sine theta is lambda spatial frequency. Um, so then in optics, we very often just don't really care about high angles. So if you have a camera here and you're looking at the world out there, things are kind of far away, right? So you don't have things coming in at 80, 90 degrees. It just doesn't happen, right? So then we start saying that, oh, sine theta is approximately theta, and lambda is just a constant. So essentially, when I talk about the direction of propagation of this light wave, it's the same thing as talking about spatial frequency. And you can think of in terms of one or the other. I find angles extremely intuitive when you're thinking geometrically, but spatial frequency is more intuitive when you're trying to think about your like, image processing algorithms. So you can just flip between the two. 
uh, interchangeably for, for the rest of today. OK, so uh, I'm allowed to have theta, and there's also a, a negative theta. And so what it, how should I think about intuitively, physically, what does a negative spatial frequency mean in this case? So is it is it the light going backwards or is it the light going in the yeah the second the other direction right exactly if it's going backwards what would change well the spatial frequency wouldn't change right if it's going backwards it would just change actually we call that time reversal so we haven't talked really about that this light is moving along this direction if it's going backwards it would just be moving the other direction okay so now I'm gonna blow your mind and tell you that a lens does a Fourier transform. So we know we have some spatial frequencies. So then I have some uh, input light beam that this like mustache guy, and he represents a. Actually, this is a complex field, right? So um, that thing had a, an amplitude and a phase. So actually, in this plane coming into this optical system, I actually have a two-dimensional complex field that I can write as some sort of map of the phase and amplitude in 2D. And I'm, I'm here to tell you that if I set up a lens one focal length away from the lens on either side, then the complex field that hits this plane will be the Fourier transform of the complex field that is here. So you can take your lens. This is not always true, right? So if I take a camera and I take a picture of you and it's focused on you, those distances are not exactly the focal lengths in which case this, that will not be a Fourier transform. So a lens doesn't do a Fourier transform. A lens plus two, one focal length on either side, exactly one focal length, does a Fourier transform. OK, this is kind of crazy, right? Um, you should take my optics class if you want to derive this and believe it. But you can. <laughs> yeah, so this is very, very, this is happening at optical speeds, right? <laughs> the speed of light. So how far is this? It has to travel 2f plus some distance to the lens, it's going to be faster than any of your computations, right? So there's a huge field of uh, optical computing that still exists, but people have kind of realized it's not super practical, in most part because we can't really measure complex fields uh, instantly, like infinitely fast. Question? Um, OK, so uh, it is a, a Fourier transform. So you see, it, this is my output field is the Fourier transform of the input field. And it's got this weird scaling by lambda f. That kind of makes sense, right? If you have different wavelengths, um, things will be different. If you have different focal lengths, things will be different. Don't worry about that. But we just pretend it's just a, a Fourier transform, because that's just a scaling factor. OK, so uh, let's think about this. Um, so let's say I put in a delta function. I'm supposed to get out just like a flat spectrum, right? So I'm sorry, I changed to ux. That's the same thing as the fx I was using before. But now I put in a delta function. So what's an optical delta function? It's like I have a piece of black cardboard with a hole in it. And so then I've got a whole bunch of light coming out. Um, a laser is not necessarily a delta function, but it should be coming out and spraying out in all directions. So yeah, sure, an LED. So say I put an LED at my input, then what do I get at the output? Well, because it's exactly one focal length away, that's the definition of the focal length of the lens, is that it's going to collimate all of that light and make it all parallel. And so then when I look at the, well, the amplitude here will just be flat. The phase will also be flat. You can tell the phase is flat because I've drawn these wave fronts, and it's straight across, right? Make sense? OK, so that gives more confidence that I'm not lying to you. Um, let's try another one. Uh, so scaling, uh, does this fit? So now we're talking about a physical system, right? We need to think about energy conservation. And this makes sense, right? So if my delta function or LED has a, like sort of a, an amount of energy described by A, then that amount of energy has to get spread out across the whole plane on the other side, right? So this is the scaling law. Makes sense, right? Um, this is really beautiful, right? We derive all these things in math, and they're true in physics. Um, so we got this scaling one. I don't know. OK, really important one coming up, shift theorem. So say I move that LED. 
to a different position, well, it's still giving off this spherical wave or light spraying out in all directions and dropping off its intensity. Now when it hits the lens, so it's hitting the lens at an angle, and if you took uh, any optics, even in high school, you know that the, the ray that passes through the center of the lens just keeps going. So you're imposing a tilt on this, so on average you get a tilted beam here. So now how does this make sense with the shift theorem? Yeah, does that make sense? So I shifted here, and here what I ended up with, well, what is the phase along this plane? It's a ramp, because the phase is, this is the, these are the phases uh, of 0 to 2 pi, right? So it's going from 0 to 2 pi as you go across the plane here, right? So that's a phase ramp, which corresponds to a shift in the other plane. Makes sense, right? And uh, we talk about inverse Fourier transform, Fourier transform. It doesn't really matter. I could go put the delta function here, and it will just be a, a ramp over here too, right? Um, the only difference is a negative sign between inverse and not inverse Fourier transform. Well, what does the negative sign do? It just flips this x top and bottom. So if I put my, uh, my delta function here, it'll, move, it'll go up here. So uh, that also s perfectly satisfied all of the, the flipping operations. Okay, um, Parseval's theorem, this, is, this one's really obvious, right? If I add up all of the energy of my complex field at the input and integrate all across all of it, it should definitely be equal to the integral of the energy at the output, assuming that the lens is not like, absorbing any light. So this is saying that energy is conserved, that the energy put into the system is the energy you get out. Of course, in practice, this lens has a finite size, and some of the light will spill off to the edges here, but that can be fully accounted for by treating it like a, a filter in the Fourier space. So your lens uh, is not an uh, infinite uh, spatial frequency pass system. It actually has a pass band set by the size of the lens. And remember we said that angle of propagation directly uh, relates to the uh, spatial frequency, right? So if this lens is this big, then this is the largest angle that can pass through the lens, right? Which means that, that tells you, just go back to that simple equation, and that tells you what's the largest spatial frequency that passes through the system. So actually, I'm doing all of this as if I'm integrating to infinity, but in reality, I should only be integrating to the maximum spatial frequency allowed by the size of this lens. So the lens's size itself imposes a bandwidth restriction on the imaging system. And this is why we have a diffraction-limited resolution. This is why we can't image things that are a quarter of an atom large with optics because we have this finite passband of our optical system. Okay, so I think a lot of this stuff will be familiar, but let's just take a, a quick look at a couple of simple Fourier transforms. So say I have a, a cosine in real space. What's the uh, Fourier space that it's going to look like? people doing this. <laughs> yeah, so I have two delta functions, but actually remember... Well. Sorry? <laughs> Good. Um, so these are actually... Oh, it's really hard to see here. They're not actually delta functions, right? Because this is, has a finite size. So my lens had a finite size, right? Had a finite bandwidth. So what are these? Not exactly delta functions, but what? Sinks, yeah. They're 2D sinks. You can see it if you turn down the lights. If I increase the spatial frequency of my input... If we'll decrease, it'll, it'll spread them out further because they're higher spatial frequencies apart. And this is absolutely true. If you were to look at your imaging system at this plane, put a camera there, you will see these two dots. Um, as you increase the spatial frequency, these, the dots go out further. You expect this, right? If I turn it sideways a little bit, what's going to happen? Which way are they going to be, this, this way or this way? I can't translate them. <laughs> so, like this, right? Oh, here you can see that there's sinks now, right? Actually, that's because it's longer in one edge than along the other one. Okay, um, if I turn it the other way, it'll go the other direction, right? Okay, so now uh, if one, I call this, this is called a 2F system because I have two focal lengths from input to output of this Fourier transform system. But if I build one of these and then build another one, uh, this is called a 4F system. 
So what does a Fourier system do? It does a Fourier transform, and then it does a Fourier transform of the result of that. So two Fourier transforms equals what? Get back to what you started, but it's got a minus flipping sign on it, right? So the flipping corresponds to the fact that if I move something up in this direction, it moves down, it moves down over here. And so, that's, so this is two Fourier transforms, uh, which is kind of like doing a Fourier transform and an inverse Fourier transform if I just flip this image. So let's start with a box. In Fourier space, it's going to be this uh, 2D sync pattern. I'm just plotting the, the magnitudes here. Actually, I'm plotting the intensities, which is magnitude squared. Uh, and then I do another Fourier transform, I get back to my box, right? So this is an imaging system now. Now I took a box and I copied it to a box here, right? So now I imaged it. Actually, the, this is what a microscope is. This is what a telescope is. This is what a lot of your typical imaging systems are. Two lens imaging systems are very often set up exactly like this to have be this 4F system, which does a Fourier, two Fourier transforms. Um, and you can kind of see it here that this focal length is shorter than this one. And because of it, this beam should be smaller. So the, the magnification of this imaging system is just the ratio of the focal lengths. We don't need to care about that. Um, but like, why would I want to do this? What can I do with this now? Yeah, I can start messing with the... Fourier plane, which is equivalent to doing physical Fourier filtering on an optical system. Um, so let's just look at a couple examples. So I make the box smaller. You're going to see it get bigger in Fourier space, but it still gets imaged exactly how it started out with. OK, so now I make three boxes. So this is like three delta functions convolved with a small rect, uh, 2D rect. Well, how does that give you this? So the three delta functions causes what over here? What does two delta functions cause? How about, if I just had this, I would have a. If I just had this, I would have a cosine there, right? Yeah. So cosine with a DC on it. So it's a one plus cosine basically, or something like that. And then what about the? And so then it's a rect. These are not deltas, right? These are rects. So it's these th this cosine plus the DC in Fourier space. But then in real space, it's being convolved with this rect function, which in Fourier space is 2D sync. So it's multiplied by a 2D sync in Fourier space, right? So this is 1 plus cosine multiplied by this 2D sync. Yeah? OK, now you can imagine what I want to do with this. Um, oh, I have a couple more examples. OK, let's just look through these. So now what's this? This is a tilted 2D cosine multiplied by a rect function, right? So in Fourier space, it's going to be the Fourier transform of one convolved with the Fourier transform of the other, right? So the Fourier transform of the... Is it an M or an example? Okay, so everybody knows it then. Well, they were probably... Oh, okay. So, it's a, so it, guys, it's more resolution now, right? So, <laughs> Okay, so we've got the... The Fourier transform of the box is this 2D sync, and then it's this 1 plus cosine, so I get three copies of it, right? And then it gets imaged. OK. Um, back to my normal example. Uh, oh, I don't know what's going on here. It's copying the same things. OK, so now this is the interesting part. Now I'm going to go take a piece of cardboard in this plane, and I'm just going to, or maybe I'll just stick my fingers there and block those two bright spots. Can't do that in MRI. Um, <laughs> oh, you can. Oh, okay. <laughs> Physically. I wish I had the physical system here. So what's going to happen now? I block these two. I call these orders. What, what do I expect at the output here? Just direct. Not, it's not going to be have this cosine modulation inside it because I blocked that spatial frequency. Yes, and it should be dimmer too, right? Because I blocked some light. So conservation of energy. If I kill light, then I have to have overall less energy at the output. Make sense? OK, here's a question. So now I've got this input, which is ASCII after homecoming weekend. And this is ASCII's Fourier transform magnitude. And then he gets imaged to here, right? This is just my imaging system. So now, in, uh, so now you can do this in your physical camera. 
And now I'm going to low-pass filter it. So say I just take a, a, a piece of cardboard with a small circle in it, right? I can low-pass filter it. Now I get this low-pass filtered version of ASCII. You can see this Gibbs ringing phenomenon on the edges. This, you will see this in a microscope if you do, if you ever, you close down the aperture of the microscope. So the aperture is just basically a diaphragm that sits in Fourier space and can be opened and closed at will to tune how big your Fourier filter is. You can do this in your physical camera if you have an SLR camera. When you change the aperture, the f-stop number, that's exactly what you're doing. You can never really close it enough to get these sort of um, uh, Gibbs phenomena really obviously showing up. But this is exactly what you're doing. You're low-pass filtering by doing this. OK, so you know what that looks like. So now, what if I do this? So what if I uh, cut off half of the spatial frequencies? Now you should know what you, MRI probably told you what's going to happen now, right? What does the image look like? Yeah, the same thing, but dimmer. Um, or what if I cut off half, but I also cut off the DC? Will it look the same? So actually, it will. Oh, what's going on with my animation? Um, it's not animating in. It will, no, if you cut off the DC, then you're cutting off. What's the DC term? It's the average energy across the whole image, right? So if you cut that off, then the image has to drop in its. You lose all the average values, right? So this will look dark. I'm not sure why it's not animated correctly. OK, so uh, there's a huge field in computational imaging that just takes something like this sort of, usually any imaging system can sort of be abstractified to a place where it has a Fourier plane. This is the most obvious way to set it up physically. But now we can start designing our, our transfer functions in Fourier space, our filters, in order to design our impulse function, right? So this is going to be a linear shift invariant system. And I can now start putting things in this Fourier plane such that uh, I'm forcing a transfer function that I would like to have such that my impulse function is whatever I want it to be, right? So typically your impulse function for an optical microscope is just this sink because you have a finite bandwidth. And so it's a circular aperture. So then actually it's, a, it's like a, a jink function, which is the circular version of a sink. And that's just what you have. But there's, uh, you can put stuff in here, right, and create whatever impulse function you want. Um, and there's an obvious question here. Why? <laughs> so I'm saying you can do this, but why should you do this, right? Any ideas why you would want to do this? Because it's cool. Because you can get everything to be convolved with some pretty picture you would like. <laughs> so that's exactly the answer I'm going to talk about. Um, this is just a fun example. There's a lot of scientific reasons why you want to do this. I just don't want to spend too much time getting into them. But this is a great example. In your, in your um, camera, so you buy an SLR camera, right? Because you want to, you want to get a lot of light into your camera. Um, so you, have the, you want this big lens. But also an SLR camera has a, a big lens which means it has a larger bandwidth than like your iPhone's camera, right? So your SLR, you know what an SLR camera is, right? It's just like the big cameras like tourists use. Um, so uh, people buy it because it has this big lens, because it has more bandwidth to it. Uh, it gets more light, too, because you're coll just collecting more light. But uh, a huge advantage is that it gets more bandwidth. And the more bandwidth, I'm not going to explain how, but it eventually results in things out of focus being more and more blurred. And things, you've seen these pictures before, right? These are like traffic lights. And they're all getting, they're blurred, but they're blurred into a circle, right? It's not a Gaussian blur. It's a circle blur. And why is it a circle blur? Yeah, so it's the shape of the aperture of the camera. And what I want to say is that I told you all this stuff about this 4F system doing Fourier transform. But if you have a regular camera, then the place where your lens is is essentially uh, the Fourier plane of your camera. Not exactly, but it's it's pretty close to being that. So if I put this, I've actually done this. You take a piece of cardboard and cut a heart out of it. So now my aperture is not a circle, but it's a heart shape. And what do you expect to see in the autofocus images? There'll be hearts. So what about the in-focus image? Should it be also hearts? 
yeah, so here's the out of focus hearts shaped, and then you can still get stuff in focus. So everything out of focus turns into a heart. There's weird clipping issues here. This is the part where it's not exactly in the Fourier space, so it's not exactly a convolution, but it's pretty close. But this is really fun to actually try at home. It's very easy. You have to make the heart really small, though. That's your pro tip. OK, so the focus is not exactly a Fourier transform. So my question now is, I've got this Fourier transform. So input, output does a Fourier transform. So what do you think is going to happen when I just move my camera? So let's just take my camera and move it out of that position, move it to a different point. So to some distance that's not exactly the focal length. You can already see this, this plane wave or like collimated light comes to like a blob now, not a point, right? Um, so you know something that happens. But what can I say about, uh, it's still going to be a linear shift invariant system, maybe. Um, so can I say anything about uh, what's the transform for not quite a 2F system? Any ideas? Yes, exactly. So that's the answer. Uh, what is a fractional Fourier transform? <laughs> Presumably you know. <laughs> yeah, so uh, let's, start, let's do an example. What's a 2.9th order Fourier transform? <laughs> well, we know what a second order Fourier transform is, right? It's two Fourier transforms. We know what a third order Fourier transform is. It's three Fourier transforms. So how do you do 2.9 Fourier transforms? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Actually, it's simpler than that. So uh, it has to be a rational frac it has to be a rational number. So the the p over q fractional Fourier this is fractional Fourier transform is the transform that when applied q times in succession yields the pth order Fourier transform. Okay, so we can define what it is. Not so obvious how to write the math, right? I'm not going to write the math, but I'll show some pictures um, because this is exactly what defocus is when you're talking about these like coherent systems with with optics. Um, so a zeroth order Fourier transform. Now my object, my input object is a rect function, right? If I do a one order Fourier transform, I get a sink. I'm only showing you the magnitudes, of course. Um, and then what's happening in between? So weird things. Ringing starts. It's sort of morphing from one into the other, right? Uh, and uh, this is exactly what you see if you defocus a coherent system. Coherent means it's used with a laser. You won't see it in your camera because it's all happening on a really small size scale. Um, you might see this eventually. But these, this is diffraction, right? So what I'm telling you is that diffraction is just fractional Fourier transforms. So say I start out with this as my object and I propagate it or defocus it or diffract it a short distance, it becomes a point tooth order Fourier transform. And you start to get these ringing effects. So all these ringing effects are like on the way to Fourier space. And then the, the ringing effects get more and more prominent. They take over eventually. And then eventually we just get the Fourier transform of the original thing at A equals 1. OK, so now I'll blow your mind again and say that I can do this in real life simply by letting the light propagate. So propagating light eventually does a Fourier transform if you go far enough away. And the far enough away depends on the size scale of things. So if I start with some stuff that's pretty small. So this is just like a piece of plastic. And somebody took the Fourier transform of something and then printed it in very small. You just need a high resolution printer to do this. And printed it onto this transparency. And now I'm going to shine a laser through it. And what happens? <laughs> So this is one. Let me find a. OK, so there's difference between these two. Um, here's another one. This one uh, is a multiplexed. These are called computer-generated holograms. So this one, here's a clue. This one is clear. It doesn't have any absorption. This was not made actually on a regular printer. This was stamped into the plastic. This one was made on a regular printer. You can print this at home if you have a high-resolution printer. Jacobs has one. But um, what do you notice about this? So it's these two angels and a huge bright dot in the center. And then there's some weird copies of the angels on the sides. Does that, how does that make sense? <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, the ones on the sides are definitely some sort of aliasing. It's basically because this thing is printed. They just print the same Fourier transform over and over and over again really small. And so my laser hits some of them on the center or not. I'll, let's try a couple more so you get the sense of this. 
Okay, here's pi. Same thing, right? Bright dot in the center, and then two, like, what's the word? Like, uh, opposites. They're symmetric, right? Or sort of symmetric. Maybe conjugate symmetric. Here's a whale. Same thing. Um, this one is not, so you could see that these ones are dark. They're, I'm calling these amplitude holograms because they're printed, they block some of the light. These are phase holograms because they change the shape of the wavefront so that, so this one's different, right? Yeah, so the phase ones are not symmetric, right? They still have the bright dot in the center. These are the two phase ones. They still have the bright dot in the center, but they're not symmetric. So any explanation? Yeah, great. So that's the exactly the point is that these are cheaper to print. These are hard to print. You have to like physically stamp these small features into the plastic. These are really easy to print on your printer if you have a high resolution printer. And the idea is that I'm printing an amplitude only Fourier filter, which means and this is the Fourier transform because I've gone far enough away. So because it's amplitude only, its Fourier transform must be real, right? Uh, sorry, because it's amplitude only, it's real, so its Fourier transform must be symmetric. And so the only thing I can get away with is to just have two copies of the thing. And does it make sense that they're, like it's not mirror symmetric, right? They're, uh, this is what conjugate symmetric basically means, right? Is that it's not a mirror symmetry, it's uh, like <laughs> opposites along a particular line, right? Um, how about the dot in the center? That's clearly a DC term. So why is that there? Right? Um, think about energy conservation. How would you get rid of the DC term? Well, you could block it, but I could go put my finger there and block it. <laughs> get rid. Of it. But I, I can't block it because I, this is in for, this is in real space. That's Fourier space. There's no, I would have to block it over there, right? So, say I wanted to design this to not have a DC term. It's the Fourier filter. Think about what's the average energy. Yeah, so I would have to be adding light in some places and taking away light in other places, right? So that the sum is zero across the whole filter. But like this is clearly not adding any light, right? It's only removing light. And so we have to start with a, uh, with a plus one. So if I was to print a co I should have brought them, but if I was to print a cosine, actually, these ones have cosines, so... Uh, these, this is basically a 2D cosine filter. Then um, I have to print one plus cosine, not just cosine, right? Because I can't make negative absorption in my filters. This is like laser, things you put on top of your laser that do. These are less exciting. You can imagine how I can make this one. <laughs> uh, there's one. Okay, great. Um, so if you want to make these at home, actually on my website we have some, uh, you can download the code and print these. They're really fun to make on your own. But basically you just design some, we call this a, this is called a computer generated hologram. It's kind of a silly term, but that's what it is technically. You print the transparency and you'll see this picture far away. So you can take the Fourier transform of anything. You'll realize really quickly you can only do simple things. Um, yeah, question? To the wall? This? So that, uh, well, it does stuff because I can't keep my hands still. Wait, I want to, you want me to change the laser to the... Uh, so this is, um, this is a different type of Fourier transform. This is just going infinitely far away, does a Fourier transform, and infinitely far away depends on how small you can print this. So if you have a bad printer and you can't print very small, then you'll have to go a lot further away to see the Fourier transform. But this one's really quite good. It's all about how far you go from the filter. Because before the filter, it's just a laser beam, right? So the laser's not changing. So this shouldn't do anything. But this will certainly change it, right? It's making it bigger or smaller. And if I got too close, it wouldn't be the Fourier transform. It would be the fractional Fourier transform. 
but too close would be like millimeters or something like that. So you'll never see it in this real life for the size of things that I've printed here. Okay, so I have eight minutes left. I think I'll skip some stuff and go. Um, so, uh, okay, so then uh, when you get closer in, it's not just a Fourier transform, but it's actually this linear system where we have some, our output complex field is the input complex field convolved with some impulse function. Maybe I designed it, maybe it's just propagation. So um, Huygens is a very famous scientist who showed that actually the, the impulse function for light is just a spherical wave. So if you take a point source, say an LED, and you let it propagate, it's just going to go out as a spherical wave, giving off light equally in all directions. And if you take some sort of complicated wave front and you want to see what's the complex field here versus here, what you'll find is that you can treat it as if you take the 2D complex field here, and for every point in space, x, y, I have an amplitude and a phase. And I can just treat that as if like, when that point in space, from going from this plane to that plane, is just going to go out as a spherical wave with the appropriate amplitude and phase. The one next to it goes out as a spherical wave with the appropriate amplitude and phase. So all of these points just give off these spherical waves. And then we need to superimpose all of the spherical waves. So we add up the complex field from each one. That is exactly what a convolution is, right? So it's a convolution with a spherical wave is what, how we do propagation. Everything gets more complicated because what your eyes see, what your camera sees, is not complex field, but actually uh, the magnitude squared, which is a nonlinear function of your field. So strange things happen, but let's not worry about it. So we treat this just like a linear system. Input complex field goes through the imaging system that has some particular impulse function, and then I get an output complex field. So this is Fourier optics. Treat it like a black box uh, it's linear space invariant. This is totally not true. Aberrations are exactly, are, aberrations describe the way in which it is not actually shift invariant. So aberrations make your camera not shift invariant and strange things happen. Linear is true. It's linear in complex field. If you take intensity, that's a nonlinear measurement. So it's not linear in uh, complex field to intensity. It's linear in complex field to complex field. And then you take the absolute value squared at the end. But uh, the complex fields are linear, so it can be written as a convolution. OK, so uh, I'll just show you one example. This is something uh, that's been around for a long time called digital holography. Um, some, one student in my lab works on this. But the idea is you take your laser, just make it a big plane wave. So this is just a coherent wave hitting a sensor. There's nothing in between. This is lensless imaging. There's no lenses. Um, and what you do is you just put your sample in here. So our sample is just a tank of water that's got a bunch of dirt in it. Um, so the black dots are to represent like whatever's in the, in the water. So we've got a tank of water, and we're simply shining a laser through it. And we take a picture on our sensor that looks like this. This makes sense, right? So these ringing things are the diffraction rings from those points that are not in focus, because there's no, there's no lens to focus anything here, right? So nothing's in focus. Um, so we have this picture. And we call this a digital hologram. Uh, it's an intensity picture. Let's not worry about that too much. But let's say I just zoom in on one particular area. Like there's clearly something going on here. There's a lot of diffraction rings happening here. There's something there, but it's out of focus, right? And it's, got, it's all diffracted because this is coherent laser light hitting the sample. But I told you everything's a linear system. So what could I do? If propagation is a convolution, how can I get this thing to be uh, refocused? So propagation is defocus, right? So if I want to refocus, I should be able to just do the inverse convolution. Yeah, so I can. So just taking this single image and doing a convolution on it. So I have a different convolution for every distance I would like to propagate, right? So as I propagate further and further, it's a different convolution, but I know it. I can write it analytically. And eventually, I get the right one. And now this thing is in focus. So I just took that previous image and convolved it with um, a particular impulse function that corresponds to a depth. I think this one is like 11 millimeters away from the sensor. So not only do I now have this digitally refocused picture, but I know that the convolution that fit it, that got this thing in focus, was 11 millimeters away from the sensor. So I also know its uh, 3D position. Um, this is a copepod. These are in your water sometimes. <laughs> so this was from a study we were doing of. Uh, water, 
not drinking water, but drinking water reservoirs. Um, uh, here's another thing that we found in the water. This is a diatom. These aren't really good for you to be drinking. Uh, but the idea is that we took a 2D image and we digitally refocused into the third dimension and we knew the depth. So we get this, it's not really 3D, it's 2.5D because it's 2D plus I know the depth. If I had like a big brick in front of something, I wouldn't be, really be able to see behind it. Um, so uh, this is a great example of like a basic tool in computational imaging with coherent optics that you can simply do these deconvolution principles to get back refocused images. Uh, here's a couple examples. This was my colleague who went on a National Geographic cruise. And some of, the, I don't know what these are, but some of these were things people had never seen before because they built this all. It's really simple, right? It's just a laser beam and a sensor. So they built it all in a really fancy housing and sent it to the depths of the ocean on this National Geographic cruise. Um, and Nick got to spend a month just taking pictures of things, cool things, and we were all really jealous that he got to go instead of us. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is an, a fun example. These are mouse whiskers. So we work with some neuroscientists who poke mouse whiskers and see what they're thinking while they're poking them. Um, so this is a, so you take a video like this, and basically you can see the 2D motions, but these, all these diffraction ringing effects are, are tagging the third dimension, the depth, right? So then I can make this 3D plot of where the mouse whiskers are over time. And I'll stop there. I think that's good for today. Thanks. I don't know if you want to take questions first. Sure. But don't let people leave. <laughs> OK. Do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, it's pretty robust. <laughs> um, so the XY resolution is set just by the same thing I told you before. It's the maximum angle that you can reach sets your, your bandwidth in Fourier space, and that's your XY resolution. The Z resolution is just, uh, it's basically like 1 over that squared. So uh, the Z resolution is always worse. But it, and it gets worse and worse as, as your XY resolution gets worse. But it's very simple to write. So you can get like, we get like 1 micron XY in our typical setup, and then like 2 or 3 microns in Z. But you can... D you can design the geometry of the system such that you're getting very high angles, and then you can improve it a lot, usually at the cost of like your field of view, how big of an area you can actually image. All right. Go ahead. Thanks, Nora. <laughs> Everyone should take the optics classes. Teachers are nice <laughs> enough to like. Yeah, 118, 218. <laughs> but it's not Fourier optics. <laughs> So um, the discussion now is lab ash, and I know Mickey's supposed to meet with some of you during the discussion section, but he had to run. Um, I think Frank is on the way, and he will hopefully be able to meet with some of you as well. But stick around if you want to talk about the project. Um, this is about part T of the lab, and honestly, it's really awesome. Um, <laughs> we're, now we're building the actual transceiver, but we're also building the layers on top. So we're building a packaging transceiver that lets us do things like send emails, text messages, or locations, things like that. And you can send 